Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is uh, Frédéric Jung. I'm the Consul General of France here in San Francisco. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here in, these beautiful, uh, in this beautiful auditorium of KQED for this Night of Ideas. On behalf of the French Consulate, I want to thank you all, those who are here in the auditorium, those who are, who are in the forum, and those who are following us online, for, uh, what, uh, for joining us for this very special night. This is, we are thrilled to be inaugurating the third in-person Night of Ideas in San Francisco. The Night of Ideas is really particularly dear to us. You know, we, the French, we like to take advantage of nights. Why sleep after all? Back in 2002, uh, the sister city of San Francisco, Paris, uh, launched uh, what they called sleepless nights or blank nights, the Nuit Blanche, uh, where art uh, would be performed all through the city. And since then, these events have occurred every, every year. A few years later, the Night of Philosophy were created to discuss ideas, talk, argue, disagree, and agree again. And eventually, the Night of Ideas was created, and it is now a worldwide event with 100 countries participating worldwide and 19 cities across the US also with thousands of participants. So of course, we would have wanted to stay here with you all night, with thousands of you, because there are so many things to discuss after all. But this year's edition will be a little shorter, but that's okay, because tonight's theme is easy and quick to discuss, rebuilding together, where are we going? <laughs> so we'll hear from several speakers. You will get the chance to interact. You will get the chance to react because this is what it is all about. Uh, the Night of Ideas is made to make us reconnect us in this room, us beyond this room, and reconnect also us, France and the United States as we are facing together so many international challenges, we think of Ukraine of course, and so many national challenges, social challenges within our countries. And the point is really to hear new ideas, to exchange ideas, to compare ideas, because it's always good to compare ideas. You'd be astonished by the number of good ideas we've had back in Europe to solve some of the problems you're facing, and just the other way around. You have so many great ideas that we don't know about that we should be uh, well advised to be using also. So comparing ideas, exchanging ideas is really something essential. And I hope it will be an inspiring night, but before we start, let me thank everyone who made this night possible. First of all, KQED, um, and uh, who you know, brought us together in this stunning place, but also uh, the partners, uh, SF, uh, the San Francisco MoMA, California Humanities, and the San Francisco Public Library, as well as our private donors, uh, the French American Cultural Society, and Bank of the West. And my great team of the consulate, of course, also. Um, but allow me to highlight that here in San Francisco, this is not a French event. This is uh, really an initiative that involves local partners that has local ownership. And finally, I want to thank, of course, the speakers, the audience, you, the artists, the volunteers, all of those who, make, who made this event possible. I will now give the floor to Michael Lambert, the San Francisco librarian. Um, merci beaucoup à tous. Bonne nuit. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frederick. Bonsoir tout le monde. Je m'appelle Michel. Ça va? <laughs> all right. It is so wonderful to be back in person with all of you this evening for the exciting Night of Ideas. I want to thank our, our partners, particularly KQED, for hosting this year. And congratulations on this spectacular space. What a privilege it is to be here to share this experience with all of you. We are so fortunate to have the opportunity to work with such an incredible group of people to bring this event together again. The Night of Ideas has truly become a phenomenon. This is something that we all look forward to in San Francisco every year. And you're all in for a real treat tonight. I want to thank our loyal audience, both here in the auditorium, but also live streaming at home. With our 2022 theme, Where Are We Going? I want to take this moment to invite all of you to patronize your neighborhood library. Libraries deliver democracy. 
And in San Francisco, you can all be proud that you have the premier urban library in the country. And we look forward to working with our partners to host this event in our main library next year in 2023. Woohoo! <laughs> But tonight, we are so grateful to be here with community because if this pandemic has taught us anything, it is that we are truly stronger together. So thank you, merci beaucoup. I hope you all have a great time tonight. Now please give a warm welcome to the executive director of KQED Live, Ryan Davis. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we are so grateful to you, to the library, to our inspiring partners at the Consulate and Villa San Francisco, at California Humanities and SF MoMA. Um, there are too many thanks to make, and you've been here a while, so I want to get y'all started. I'm the executive director of KQD Live, Ryan Davis. We've been collaborating on Night of Ideas for four years now, from our first all-night program taking over the San Francisco Public Library's main branch, um, to figuring out how to turn it into a communal experience um, of thought and artistry in a collage uh, for people to experience meaningfully from their home before we could responsibly gather again like we are tonight. Um, and we're honored to welcome all of you, all of our guests here at KQED's newly renovated studio headquarters in San Francisco's Mission. We call this gathering place the Commons, um, and as its name suggests, it's dedicated to the common good, to bringing people together to consider our shared responsibilities, to appreciate the things that distinguish the Bay Area's cultural abundance, um, and to understand what bonds us. Night of Ideas exemplifies this kind of civic and cultural expression of the Bay Area at its best. And we are so grateful to folks like all of you who bring that spirit of community investment into this space. Uh, we hope you'll share your questions and your thoughts with us. Uh, write them down on the cards and pencils that you received on your way in and hand them toward the center aisle throughout the program where ushers will collect them um, continuously. We'll sort them, we'll try to work them into the conversation on the stage here. Um, your voice is as essential as ours is tonight in this collective enterprise. And now, to inspire us with the power of collective voice, before our talks and our discussions get underway, it's my privilege to welcome to the stage the San Francisco Girls Chorus. all of them tonight.
Good evening. I like to talk. Um, doesn't seem like this because it's the night of ideas and of course tonight of all nights I have no idea what I'm going to say <laughs> except that I know it was a good idea to wear flowers on my shirt that match my shoes. Like, I don't, you're not gonna hear anybody flyer tonight, I guarantee that. But tonight, expect to hear some, some oohs, and maybe some ahs. It's about time we get on to the night of ideas. Start it with our first movement. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Are you ready to be enlightened? So am I. Coming to the stage, Sharia Souza, who is the executive director of the American Indian Cultural District of San Francisco. Next, we have Anuradha Mittal, who is the executive director of Oakland Institute. And then we have Mathieu Dufayette. He's the chief innovation officer of Super Blue. And next, we'll have Deanna Van Buren, She's the co-founder, design director of Designing Justice, Designing Spaces. I'll let you guys take it from here. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharia Souza, Tata Tals Pueblo Ute in Kiowa, and I am the Executive Director of the American Indian Cultural District. Today our panel is about the built environment, and there's no better way to talk about where our environment is built on than by starting with acknowledging the Ramatush Ohlone, the ancestors, the relatives, the traditional stewards whose land that we are on. The Ramatush Ohlone have never lost, ceded, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the first people of this land. And today when we talk about decolonization and decoloniality, it really starts with acknowledging that's where we are. Native people are not dead, we are not other, we are not a thing of the past, we are here, and we're going to use our voice to continue to elevate so that our children don't have to say that we are here. So I just wanted to start off with the significance of when decolonizing our mind and decolonizing our space, really think about how we talk about Native peoples as a people of the past. Today, the idea that I'm up here to talk about or to share with you all is around our indigenized project, specifically genocide mapping. I'm with the American Indian Cultural District, and we were founded of March of 2020 during the middle of the pandemic. And in the pandemic, we learned a lot. We lost a lot, we gained a lot. Our people you know, went through a lot of different crises and things that they needed to heal from. But during the pandemic, there also came a movement of racial equity for our people an opportunity for us to take these times and these tragedies that we've gone through and really learn how to use them as we're losing people, as we're adapting as a society, as we're going through these hardships, to learn how to heal and to work together. And so one of the things we focus on at the American Indian Cultural District is elevating the American Indian community voice. So when we talk about land acknowledgements and the land we're on, we have to think about the history of San Francisco and what San Francisco was founded on honoring. And it's the unfortunate truth. The majority of the history of San Francisco, when we look at the streets, when we look at the statues and the monuments, memorials, were founded on acknowledging those who were part of the genocide of American Indians. So one of the ideas that we came up with, and as you can see up here, is mapping genocide. We started by looking at the place names of streets. Our colleague Jason McConnell, largely responsible for a majority of this research, and we found that 35 or 37 streets, excuse me, in San Francisco alone really honored those of genocide. We mapped just some of those streets in red, as you can see up there. And as you can see, these are really some of the main streets in San Francisco that you travel down every day. In fact, Lion Street, which is a lead to the Golden Gate Bridge, is crossed by over 40 million people every year. But not a lot of people know the history of Nathaniel Lyon. Nathaniel Lyon was a Civil War Union general, and he was responsible for the Bloody Island Massacre in Lake County, killing over 500 men and women Pomo people. He said that the people basically laid down with no fight, 
as he slaughtered them with no discretion against men and women as they fell. And he said that the order to massacre was followed fearfully. And so these are the streets, these are the histories, these are the main corridors that were going down every day. If you all don't know the history of Christopher Columbus and what he did in terms of taking indigenous peoples as slaves, this land was not discovered. There were already people here, but we don't talk about those impacts or even what our, one of the most liberal cities is really founded on. Another example I want to give to you all, the American Indian Cultural District is currently out at Fort Mason. Uh, again, we look at Fort Mason and we're like, this is a really great place and it is a really beautiful space. But to understand the history of Mason, Mason was uh, a military, one of the first governors of California, and he gave each rancher in Southern California two horses to, I repeat, it is expel and exterminate American Indians in Southern California to further the uh, gold rush era to exterminate American Indians. Today, the American Indian Cultural District Hub sits there with different folks like the Association of Ramatushaloni, the Indians of all tribes, the International Indian Treaty Council, and the American Indian Film Institute. Many people don't know that Fort Mason was actually one of the places that after the occupation of Alcatraz in San Francisco, which is where folks came together in 1969 to really talk about not having a place for American Indians, one of those, one of those places that was actually promised or negotiated as part of the occupation of Alcatraz, where folks really wanted to take that land back and create visibility for American Indians, was the area of Fort Mason. So it is really healing to be out there today and to be by the water. And so what I would like to share with you all is an idea, an idea of how we give the voice back to American Indian people, how we bring visibility to the fact that over 35 streets and over 10 statues and monuments and memorials out of the 100 that exist in the city are really founded on those and really placed on those that have committed genocide to American Indians. And what I want to share with you is ways that we can bring truth and healing. So the American Indian Cultural District has partnered with the SF MoMA the, the public library, and soon some of our community members to come together and really talk about healing conversations and ways we bring back empowering people to rename some of these streets and some of these areas. So what we're doing is we're mapping this out and we're hoping to work with SF MoMA to provide these maps to community members to show them where the streets are and to really hear their vision and their voice and their ideas for how they want to bring healing and how they want to rename these streets. What statues and monuments and memorials do they want to see in the place of those that committed genocide towards their children? Another effort that we've done is we're working with the San Francisco, I'm sorry, San Francisco SF Heritage, um, and we're actually working with our different native orgs and businesses to document the legacy of businesses in the American Indian Cultural District and throughout the city, so that when you can go around on walking tours, you can learn from indigenous people, by indigenous people, what the history of the city is, and that we are here, and that we have been here, and that we will continue to be here, and we will continue to grow. And just as one more acknowledgement of where we are tonight, just down the street is the American Indian Cultural District, and we're about to be on our third expansion, and KQED studio that we're in here tonight will be within the American Indian Cultural District in the traditional lands of Yolamu on Romatush Ohlone land. So I just wanted to share this with you all and share with you, you know, this was not founded in March of 2020. The American Indian Cultural District, the American Indian community has always been here, and they've been fighting, and we've always had a history here. So I just want to share this example and these ways of bringing the truth and the healing through our different projects to bring the voice back to the people, to ask them what they want, and to see what beautiful ideas they come up with to heal this history of how our city is founded. And there's one more area to this I'd like to share. We're doing it with our partnerships, but we've also recently worked with the Human Rights Commission to do an American Indian Truth and Healing Ad Truth and Healing Reparations Advisory Committee. And what we hope is some of those suggestions will actually be implemented and carried out in a 10-year plan where those individuals work with the Human Rights Commission, with the Board of Supervisors, and with the mayor to share their vision and help raise their voices. Um, right here, as you can see in the imagery, is uh, the kickoff of Aromatosh Ohlone Waterfront Trail, which is part of our indigenized project. Um, right here, uh, where you see myself and my colleague Paloma Flores, we're sitting right here on the Christopher Columbus statue that was removed uh, for Coit Tower. 
And then right here is a celebration, the 53rd annual for the occupation of Alcatraz. And right here, you see Mayor Breed partnering with, with us on our one-year anniversary as part of our indigenized mural project. And here, we're working with Dolores Park to talk about truth is healing and the history of what happened at Dolores Park and the mission systems and the massacres of over 14,000 American Indians who were slaughtered at that site. And right here, we have uh, Helen Wakazu. I'm sorry, Helen Wakazu, who's honoring her mother, Karen Wakazu, I'm sorry, Karen Wakazu, honoring her mother, Helen Wakazu. And they're talking about renaming Julian Way in the mission uh, to Wakazu Way to honor some of our strong American Indian leaders and our board president, Mary Travis Allen, who was recently honored for uh, Women's Heritage Month. So I just wanted to share some of the great, amazing things that are happening that not many of you know about, but some of these opportunities in these ways that you and your community can bring truth and light to what the city's founded on, but not only bring that truth, but work together to bring healing. So I just wanted to thank you all and thank you for this time and this space. And I look forward to learning and growing together and hearing the unique and beautiful ideas that are shared here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. What a beautiful idea That's whose time has come a long time ago. My name is Anuradha Mittal. I am with the Oakland Institute, and I'm here to give you some good news. We know how to feed, clothe, and shelter the world. We do know how to feed, clothe, and shelter everyone in this world. What we have to figure out how to remove those uh, from power who prevent that from happening. And this is what we do at the Oakland Institute, a progressive, independent policy think tank. Just a quick word, very often I'm asked, why is it called the Oakland Institute? When I think of right-wing think tanks, they're not called Center for Generating Unemployment, Center for Ending Healthcare. They're called Cato, Hudsa. That's why we're not called Center for Global Justice, but called the Oakland Institute. What we do in our work is to acknowledge the history of enslavement, colonization, systemic structural racism, which perpetuates white supremacy. It is this mindset which allowed King Leopold, for instance, to claim resources in the Democratic Republic of Congo, unleashing brutal exploitation of the communities and the theft of their resources. Lands belonging to the communities were stolen to turn into palm oil plantations to benefit what has come to be known as Unilever. And communities were forced into slave labor. The English colonial regime created the Serengeti National Park, supposedly to conserve and protect the environment, while displacing the original stewards of the land, the Maasai, from the ancestral lands. The same mindset today continues the colonization project, despite countries gaining independence. The past brutality was explained as a way of bringing civilization to the primitives, to the savages, and today's euphemisms are investing in land to feed the world, carbon credits for mitigating uh, climate crisis, conservation schemes to protect biodiversity. All of these not only destroy the well-tested solutions for feeding the world, stewarding the land, and ensuring livelihoods with dignity, but they have launched a slew of human rights abuses. So an idea for tonight is what we do at the Institute is to dismantle these false solutions and call it what it is, carbon colonialism, carbon con uh, uh, col conservation colonialism, corporate industrial agriculture, which colonizes a food system. In Tanzania, as we speak, under the guise of conservation, nearly 160,000 Maasai again face evictions because of plans of UNESCO's World Heritage Committee and um, and IUCN. The reality is they want to displace them for safari parks and tourism. At the Institute, we are, through our research, disclosing these plans of fortress conservation, which exclude and put the indigenous on shrinking spaces, exactly what was done in the United States, to put people on reservations and steal their resources and claim to protect nature from humanity. In Uganda, a Norwegian firm, Green Resources, took over the land of villagers for forestry plantations for carbon credits. Displaced from the lands, the villagers lost their livelihoods while the timber from the plantations is sold to Asian markets, bringing additional revenue to green resources. 
exposing and holding the powerful accountable through our research and advocacy and communication strategy, we were able to get the largest carbon credit buyer of this firm, Sweden, to end its partnership with Green Resources. Then you have US-based New Ireland Hardwood Timber Company, which has red plans for New Ireland and East New Britain. I'm not talking about UK. These are places still named in Papua New Guinea after the colonizers have supposedly left. Carbon cowboys are now persuading the clans to sign up projects without free prior informed consent from the indigenous communities. Amidst lies and false promises, the raiders have arrived to again pillage and plunder. So idea is resistance. Landowners in Papua New Guinea are mobilizing, where government, because of research and partnerships with local communities that we have, led to the cancellation of several illegal land deals. From Sierra Leone to Nigeria, through Guinea, Ivory Coast, and Cameroon, communities living near the palm oil plantations and rubber plantations of Sockfin and Bellore, which is a Fortune 500 company in France, they're standing up for their rights and against repression. Sockfin's profits ballooned to over 18, 80 million euros with the price increases of palm oil and rubber. But these profits have come at a very high price for the communities who have seen their land stolen and resources grabbed. And when they resist, they face intimidation, harassment, and human rights abuses. In Democratic Republic of Congo that I started my presentation with, villages are standing up to Koromo Capital Management, which is now running the oil palm plantations on lands that were stolen by King Leopold. The problem is that our destiny is linked with theirs. Kuromo Capital Management has investments from U.S. universities, including University of Michigan, Northwestern University, Melinda and uh, uh, Bill Gates uh, Foundation. They're pension funds which are invested in these funds. As the villagers face beatings, arrests, and even killings when they resist and demand their lands back. Working together with student groups at Michigan, or even at Harvard University who are saying no to land grabs from Boston to Brazil. We are really talking about responsible endowments and linking local to global. We can't talk about dismantling white supremacy just as a slogan. We have to work on ideas that stop the policies that come from the West, such as the World Bank policies of doing business rankings that rank countries on what they like to do business with. You're not ranked for promoting welfare of your people. You are ranked for letting for foreign corporations come in and plunder your lands. We are very proud that we worked with partners around the uh, globe and led a coalition called Our Land, Our Business, which ended doing business rankings last year. And now we have to end the business of doing agriculture, which sees the global south still as resources to be captured and colonized for the benefit of a few, the Western corporations and the elites in the West. The idea, we have messed up, my generation has messed up, we are leaving behind the generation that will come. A messed up future with climate crisis, continued globalization, continued uh, uh, you know, greed. The idea is students are not leaders for tomorrow, they are leaders today. As the students and the youth march for justice, for climate, when I think of the killing of Mr. Floyd last year and the Oakland Tech students that gathered and marched together, brown, white, black students together, our fate depends on them. So I think one of the big things for the idea is how do we really promote the youth to be the leaders of today and not leaders tomorrow? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mathieu de Fayette, and I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Superblue. A long, long time ago, in France, in one of these night of ideas, uh, my great-great-grandfather, maybe more great, Edouard de Laboulet, had an amazing idea. He said, let's celebrate democracy and this amazing new democracy that is America, and let's give them the Statue of Liberty. It was an amazing idea. I wish I had the same idea tonight to reveal. I'll do my best. <laughs> Uh, but bear with me. A few months ago, I was in this beautiful place that I love in Big Sur, California, called Esalen, the Esalen Institute. And it's a beautiful place for a retreat, you know, to have workshops, take a pose from like our crazy lives when you're lucky to go there. And they have an art shack that I love. It's a small little barn where I usually go in between workshops and I'm mostly alone. 
And there's always some interesting stuff to see. And I stumbled upon this beautiful book called A Family of Man. Not only I love the name, but I also love the theme because it's exactly about what I'm going to talk about. The Family of Man is the book of one of the most ambitious photography exhibit that happened just after World War II. It started in New York City at the MoMA, and it was a collection of hundreds of photos from all around the world of human beings at every stage of life, from love, birth, to death, joy, and in everything else. And it reminded me that photography and art in general is a good way to reconnect us, especially in difficult times. And photography especially because it's about like getting us face to face with us fellow human beings and showing that everywhere we live, we face the same humankind. And in those difficult times, I mean, we cannot not talk about the pandemic, this increasingly political difficulties, the fact that our society has been divided more than ever, and the fact there is so much inequalities that fragmented us. It's interesting to see about how art can help us heal together and reconnect us. We've been completely disconnected from each other in real life for the last two years, and hopefully we're away from that, but nobody can bet. But we spent more and more time, we all know that, including me and all of you, online. Meetings after meetings, Zoom after Zoom, celebrating events, goods and bads, remotely in front of a screen. We spent endless time on Zooms, but also on Animal Crossing, on Grand Theft Auto, on all these big games where some of us had like happy hours on a Friday night instead of getting together as we love to be as fellow humans in a bar or in a park or anything well. And some of us think that it should continue, that living in this metaverse is possibly a good place to be, especially when the world is falling apart. I don't think that way, and I believe it's time to reinvest reality. I believe it's time to augment the places where we live, this little local park, this little coffee shop, and it's been so hard because whenever we went there, even the fellow humans that we saw had a mask on, like sadly, all of you tonight, <laughs> but we'll get there. Um, and so a year ago, I joined this company called Superblue. Superblue is all about like getting amazing experiential art for as many people as possible. But the laws of physics, which is like putting art in a building, doesn't allow us to achieve this mission about like getting art anywhere, anytime to as many people as possible. So I took these learnings that I got from many years at a company born here in San Francisco called Niantic that in 2016 put into the world a very little game called Pokemon Go that became in a, very, in, in a few weeks a worldwide phenomenon where we saw people using technology not to be disconnected from each other, but to be connected with each other in real life. And so the power and the, the amazing thing that happened at that time inspired me to do something not about Pokemon anymore, but about art, and about art that connects people together instead of being some, on, only something for the 1%, or something that stays only in museums or galleries. And so when I joined Superblue, my vision was to say, what can we do with this technology, augmented reality? We have artists that are like augmenting reality. And what better artist than JR, who was uh, at the Night of Ideas in 2019, who's kind of famous for you know, connecting people together who are taking portraits of each of them and back to this family of man, showing us our connected humanity. He's done an amazing, uh, amount of stuff in the last 10 years, including Inside Out, this project that connected more than half a million people in 140 countries. More recently, you saw the cover of Time magazine. Um, he did it like three years ago with this controversy about guns in America, but more recently with Valeria, this little girl from Ukraine that is here, held by many people, and he toured the many cities in Europe as a tribute to all the suffering that is happening right now in this region of the world. But more importantly, it's all about connecting people through art and putting faces and places together. 
And so what I'm about to present to you, and I'm very proud of it, and you're the first one to see it, is what it means when you experiment, and it's typically San Francisco with technology and an artist that is all about, who is all about connecting people together through art. So let's play this video. Hey, I'm JR, and I make art to bring people together. My latest project is called Reality. soon it's it's coming soon it's all about like taking all these places that are familiar to you in your neighborhood and they've become an anchor for people to add their stories about what they love about this place why they love their neighborhood why they love this coffee shop love story for someone else something about activism or artivism anything that goes into your mind so that all of a sudden we reinvest our cities and we become this family of mine again so very excited to share this idea with you tonight and we hope to see you on GR reality very soon thank you very much exciting speakers. I'm kind of fired up. <laughs> so my name's Deanna, and I'm just going to introduce myself as an abolitionist architect. You're like, what is that? Yes. Woo. And I'm an architect that is working towards building a world without prisons, without jails, without detention centers, without police stations, without courthouses as we know it. And I do this for two reasons. The first is that the criminal justice system in the United States, mass incarceration, is anchored and rooted in the historical legacies of slavery in this country, right? Is it a structurally racist system? But there's a second reason I do it, right? As an architect, because what I'm seeing is that the ideologies, the values, and the beliefs of that system literally get rendered and manifested in bricks and concrete and steel and glass. And let me tell you all, the power of architecture is it really exacerbates and amplifies and foments those beliefs and ideologies, and it hurts us. Right? Sometimes the built environment even kills us. So for 10 years, what we've been doing is researching in the United States and all over the world alternatives. I've worked with hundreds of incarcerated men and women, their communities of care, about what kind of vision they see for in the future. We've also been prototyping and trying out new things, and I'm so happy to share with you today that I believe we have identified what we're calling the ecosystem of care, right? The infrastructure that we need to replace that system. So what I want to share with you are in these eight categories. I'm going to share one in each of them. So I'm hoping you can start to see what I see, right? And these are spaces for diversion, reentry, restorative reinvestments, spaces for youth, education spaces, spaces for behavioral health, specialized housing, and survivor spaces. So let's start with diversion. We need to begin to divert people out of the system altogether. Right? And there's a wonderful way that we can start to do that and by embracing an indigenous practice called restorative justice or peacemaking. And for those of you that don't know, restorative justice is a, is a philosophy and set of practices that says when someone has been harmed, their needs be, could be addressed and that those who have committed that offense are responsible for that. It brings those parties together to potentially repair that breach of relationship and return them to society. So what we started to do in Syracuse was we created the first peacemaking center bringing Native American peacemaking practices into a non-Native community for the very first time in the US. And I was able to engage the community like, well, what should a peacemaking center look like? What kind of spaces should it have? Where should we go? I've never been in one. And we were able to take this old drug house and turn it into a center for peacemaking. And I was just there last Monday and amazing things are happening, right? The police are bringing people here instead of downtown. The school across the street is diverting cases out of the school, the most complicated ones, into peacemaking. People are coming to sign up for peacemaking. The community started to use the space for their quinceañeras, for their birthday parties. Essentially what's happening is this place is starting to create social cohesion, right? The thing that really keeps us safe. So while we need to look at diversion, right, we also need to support the folks coming home because they're all coming home, y'all. Like 95% of folks are coming home. Many have been incarcerated for decades, 
right? They have no sense of what's happening in society, and we've got to start making places for them. So we're starting to create re-entry campuses, working with black churches and nonprofits to create a place where folks can come home, they can reunite with their families, they can get educational service, they can start to be trained in jobs, like in this case, in a cafe, they have places to grow food, and they're all living in a beautiful sort of domestic setting, right, where they can actually start to thrive and transition and learn the life skills they need to land and truly, truly come home. So when we look at where the money's going, right? We're building jails, we're building prisons, but what we've been doing is divesting in the communities that need the support, right? So it's important to divest from that system and begin to do restorative reinvestments in community. Some of you may know this project in Oakland. It is the country's first center for restorative justice and restorative economics. And we worked with the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights to purchase this building, right? We gutted it and we turned it into these mixed use, multi-use hubs that every city I work in in the country, people say they need. And in this space, they're able to anchor their community organizing and activism around ending mass incarceration. There are groups working on immigrant rights and tenant rights. It has a restaurant that trains low wage restaurant workers to get living wage jobs and fine dining. It has the county's first dedicated space for restorative justice and what they've been able to do is amplify that practice, feed folks during COVID, set up a fund for the community, right? So the place and the program is beginning to bring rich resources to this community, and we are replicating this model in Detroit and building it out to create an entire campus. So youth spaces, number four. Our youth have nowhere to go, y'all. Like, they can go home and they can go to school, right? And often in the communities we're working in, there's nothing for them. And so this project, the Pop-Up Village, starts to look at the broad spectrum, right? We can't just make spaces for teenagers. We need to span the full spectrum from transition age youth down to babies. And this project is really focused on our little ones. We've been working with UCSF, OBGYN, to be able to create something called the Pop-Up Pregnancy Village. And what it does is bring resources to the Bayview Hunters Point, not far from here, to address the fact that black women in particular suffer from preterm birth at very high rates, in particular in communities impacted by mass incarceration, right? The system puts incredible stress on them. They don't feel safe going into a traditional uh, hospital, right, due to a lot of the racist experiences. So what this brings is culturally relevant services and resources and a beautiful environment for them, right? And it's not just services, right? It's joy, right? We got doulas and doctors and DJs and ceremony. And Mayor London Breed has identified this project as a critical strategy in her children and family's recovery plan after COVID. Education spaces, right? We know that access to advanced levels of education are one of the greatest predictors of reduced recidivism. And so this is a little bit of an unconventional education space. We took a San Francisco municipal bus and we turned it into a classroom for 15 students and a teacher. It goes to housing projects around the city and it's target, targeted for systems impacted folks, folks coming home and their communities of care so they can get a GED and high school diploma, right? And it's important because they can't cross turf lines all the time. Turf lines we may not be able to see. They can't get access to the services due to space and time, lack of public infrastructure, no car. This vehicle has been able to serve 50 new students every year, right? Bringing them the opportunity to get living wage jobs. And I'll tell you, out of all the prototypes, this is the one everyone seems to want. I get a call every month like, we want one of those buses. So I'm telling you, you're going to see this one a little bit more. The next two are critical. Right? Spaces for behavioral health is a major one. We know that 50% of folks incarcerated suffer from a behavioral health issue, right? 25% from severe behavioral health issues. And in jails, it is a leading cause for suicide. So what we've been starting to do is work with folks in LA County to address an alternatives to care approach that they're starting to take to end youth incarceration. The Flow Center will be a space for youth to get a holistic experience of behavioral health, not just therapy, right? Access to jobs, education, art therapy, music therapy. They wanted to have a barber. This is what they wanted, right? And we can begin to create these spaces to address one of these main drivers of mass incarceration. The second is housing, y'all. Thousands of folks are coming home due to our early release programs. You've seen the homelessness situation in our city and in Oakland around the Bay. Guess what? A big portion is due to the fact that folks are coming home and they can't get housing. 
Yeah, so one of the things that we're working on, from small to large, right, we looked at the reentry campus, but we've been working with incarcerated men and women to create these sort of mobile rooms because in transitional housing, it looks not so different from being in prison. It's not safe, they're scared, it's hard to re-enter. So we design these units, we prototype them, and they provide dignity and privacy in these environments when they come home. But what's been great is we've also been able to have them build them, right? So they're learning skills in digital fabrication, so they have living wage jobs. We're starting to stack those functions. And so last but not least, spaces for survivors. This infrastructure literally doesn't exist at all. And it's not surprising, right? You know, in our criminal justice system, it's not about survivors, right? If it's a crime, it's a crime against the state. So we need to start to build spaces for folks so they can heal. And we've been working with the Center for Court Innovation in New York and groups like Common Justice, who are restorative justice groups. We work with detectives, we work with prosecutors, we work with survivors themselves, victim advocates, to do the research and real world projects to see what kind of environments they need. And you know, they just need a space where they feel safe, you know, where they feel calm, where they don't run into the person who's harmed them, right? They need objects of comfort, daylighting, plants, uh, a little hospitality, soft furniture, a home-like sitting setting. This is called trauma-informed design, right? We apply it to all our projects. And later this year, we will be doing some real-world projects, but also a toolkit that'll get disseminated so that folks around the country can begin to do this. So I've showed you eight things, right? But you all, we're building a lot of things. And the communities we're working with have a million ideas. And honestly, there's probably a million more, right? So we build what we believe. Right? If we believe that black and brown communities deserve thriving, beautiful spaces to live, if we believe that we can have a justice system that is actually not about punishment and retribution, but is about healing and repair, we can build that. I mean, that's the world I want to live in, don't you? Don't you? Yeah, so join me in that, right? It's going to take all of us, right? Everyone in this room has a special gift that they can bring to this. And that together, I know that if we work and we can believe and shift that, we can build that, and we can really create a place where everyone's free. Thank you. Mike check, Mike check. Um, if you'd like to use the bathroom or grab another drink, I'd like you to know that the program is running out in the lobby, and we have plenty more uh, for you to imbibe in. Also, if you would like to ask a question, please fill out one of these cards, and we'd like to get to it. Or uh, Dan and Carlos, who you'll meet in a second, will rap about it. But first, Shariah and Anuradha. What are the first steps that we can take us in the audience can take to decolonize the great city by the bay, San Francisco. Let's keep it to about 30 seconds because we only have five minutes for this portion. Yeah. Say, so just start by learning about it and spreading the word and, and being humble and being open, even as, an, even as an indigenous person, just learning from my elders every day. Just like, wow. So learn about it. Share the news. You hear something great like everything I heard up here. Uh, spread it. Pass it forward. I would agree with that and say one is acknowledgement and then not just acknowledgement work to change it. Mm -hmm. We are seeing statues of colonizers come down. There is no time left for us to have them up there. They have to come down now. And that's when the new future can start. So, Matthew. There was a time where um, the streets were painted yellow, you know, after George Floyd's death. And this idea that art brought people of all walks of life to the street together, and this is from DC to Oakland. And I was wondering, how much do you think art, especially that interactive art, how much do you think that plays a part in bringing us together as a people? I mean, the example that I shared with this artist, French artist JR, is a good example of um, art that is meant to be uh, experienced together because it's all about like taking portraits of people that are 
not used to go to museum or galleries like everyday people and, and, and just sharing uh, what these portraits mean for them and, and, and for others and what actions they believe in, like in a piece of art that is collectively shared and used uh, in the media. Um, the physicality of it makes it hard to scale, so that's where like technology comes in. And, you know, I don't think we're very far from like a moment where like we will wear glasses that will enable um, a world where like we will see potentially, you know, uh, bad things, but mostly good things and seeing the world like artists would be very interesting because when you can turn like a public, you know, lamp into something that is different, when you can see beautiful murals and folding on buildings, when you can see, um, you know, people's faces connected to places and stories that they want to say, I think it's going to be very interesting. So. And you know, I'm for glasses because I haven't had the LASIK yet. And so I'm still going <laughs> to, I haven't done SNAP. Yeah, you and I are lucky we already have uh, glasses. So it's not going to be a big change. <laughs> Deanna, going off of that, the, the defund the police movement, um, however it was phrased, but the idea behind it about taking money from this carceral nature our society has uh, indulged in, particularly against people of color. Uh, the idea of being abolitionist, um, prisons, police, but this idea of investing in a community, why is that so strange for this country to really think about? Like, hey, if you wanna stop crime, if you wanna stop you know, all these things, what would happen if you invested that money into the people? you wouldn't have all the violence we see. You wouldn't have all the poverty you see. We wouldn't have it, but uh, folks are racist, honey. And they're not, <laughs> they don't want to invest, right? They're making a lot of money off that system, right? The people, it's working really well for some people, that system. And they want to keep it that way. Um, and it's, it's so obvious that we could really shift those funds to do some great things and bring community that what they need to thrive. It's so, sim it's so simple in its optics it's so hard in the, in the feelings that people have about it. What would be the first thing if you had that blank check or if you had, say, I don't know, a tenth of Oakland's police budget, which would be several millions of dollars, what would be the first thing you would do to reinvest in the community? Well, at first I'd get a new car for myself. Is that okay? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> got to invest, got to start, put your own mask on first, honey. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I would love to set up a land trust, right? Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with folks around that, you know, supporting black land trust, supporting uh, solidarity around that and being able to invest in that uh, so that people can, we don't lose everybody, right? The gentrification is immense, right? So that's a, just try to stabilize place for people would be the first thing that I would do. I, th I think I'd build grocery stores too for, yes, for yes. people. It's one of the things about Buffalo, people don't realize that that part, Eastern Buffalo, is what they call a food desert, where people don't have places to go get food. Mm -hmm. And the <laughs> one places they do have is attacked. Um, that was very intentional. Um, who asked the question about libraries? About what libraries can do? Uh, I don't know who asked it, but please, let's have a conversation because I'm very interested in who is interested in libraries. Well, we'll do that after. Right now, I want to bring my friends Dan and Carlos up to, um, so what are we going to do, you know? I mean, every time... Man, I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to rap a little bit. Like, I hear Carlos on the beat. That means I want to spit some bars. Now, I'm going to save it for y'all. Dan, let me give you these cards. I'm trying to take them to rap hard. But ideas coming from the mind. This is old lady land where we stand. Put the cards up in my hand. Before I stop rapping, I'm going to stop and stand. What's up, everybody? My name is Dan Wolf. This is Carlos Aguirre. We represent the Bay Area Theater Cypher. We live on the cross fader of music, of theater, of art, and community. I'm gonna pass this mic to my friend. We've been backstage listening to the speakers. We wanna try to sum up what they did and what they said in a few minutes here. 
So bear with us. This is all freestyle. This is all in the moment. Thank you all for your genius, your brilliance. Uh, yes, spit it off the top of my head. This is proof that natives aren't dead. They are here. They are people in the present moment. Give the equal love and kind. Here I'm rapping, but you're out there genocide mapping. That is beautiful. Came to rip this piece out of the whole district that you represent. I turn the page, cause they lying and lions for the stage. Food, cloth, and shelter. It's the world they are dropping helter skelter. Out there dropping bombs and feeling free. No, right now we try to change the history. Cause King Leopold is Donald Trump. Community shooters and all that stuff. Colonized society is where we live. Try to change it back to the way we lived. Back in the day, Ken Stelter. Yo, we gotta learn from the elders. Passing down, disconnect us from the land. We gotta change that plan. Uh, dismantle false solutions. Steal resorts, change the reservations. Resolutions, it's the proof in where I'm living, how I'm giving. KQED, make some noise tonight if you're staying alive and feeling good right now. These are ideas coming off our head. One more, one more for me, one more for me, and I'll pass it to Carlos here. Uh, I dream of a world without jails, a world without these fails, the way they put us all in the custard. Yo, they gotta change criminal justice. Yes, diversion and it's missing. We gotta get them out of the system. We gotta take it. We gotta give them all the love, all the re-entry systems. They gotta come home. They gotta find a place. Place making it, making this all the space. Oh, I think I'll pass all the cards cause it's holding me down and I'm losing my guard and I'm feeling my soul and I'm losing control and I gotta feed me night of ideas. Make some noise, put your hands to the sky. D-Wolf, the next one is coming live. Check, check, one, two, one, two. Check, check, one, two, one, two. Check, check, one, two, one, two. Yeah, one, two, one, two. Hey, make some noise for the world's purest girls chorus. I know you all heard it. Yeah, that's right from the front to the back. Everybody right now, cause we keep it intact. Hey, yes, y'all, I don't have to look, but it's okay. We in the commons, but we're not common. We be dramin'. Everybody knows we be dropping the bombin'. Hey, stay common when I'm relaxed. Never tax, feel the saxophone. And relax when I get the classes, yo. Yes, that's to build my environment. I'm never tired when I hit seven generations ahead. Because my people know what's up. I'm never subliminal. Part of the originals. Yes, yes, y'all. To from the front to the back, that's right, y'all. One time in the stump. Yo, cause that shit is hella wide. And I know what we're talking about when we're mapping genocide. That's why we have to see with inner eyes. Everybody in best believe. My name is Infinity, but you're gonna need more than two horses to get rid of me. Yes, y'all, that's right. I'm staying tight from the top, y'all. And make it down, representing that hop, y'all. I'm making fight, y'all. And you'll believe this. No, JR realism. That's right, y'all, for real. Get to get to meet them and fight the colon colon colonialism. I'm trying to flip the word, hit the bird, and hold people that are powerful accountable. And that's right, y'all, because I be counting bulls. One, two, and three every time I see in between. One minute left for a true MC. Let me get it down, y'all. The youth is the truth. The youth for tomorrow. A hard truth to swallow. But we have to feel that just like a bottle. And everybody knows connecting stories like we connect to art. And here's the art. I've been smart from the start. No matter when my heart rip it apart. But racism is structured. I'ma be an architect of change If you listen in between Every time I spit the bars I'm a Mexican jumping bean I'm a fiend for every team between That's right y'all And I don't mean to split hairs But I used to live in the mission When Mexicans actually lived there But now it's all different kinds of things in between An ecosystem of care you've never ever seen Peacemaking centers all around the world Diversion, re-entry, restorative reinvestment And new spaces I know you hate to say it But yo, I'm trying to fight these races In all these spaces So why, why, why would I stay complacent? That's why I'm gonna face it And fly like a spaceship I'm never sissy like SpaceX I'm breaking down the basics Yes, y'all, thank you very much Thank you, we'll be back Brup, 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 brup Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was hella cool, wasn't it? All off the top, too? Mine wasn't. Um, I kind of like wrote it down, told Carlos I was going to get in there. But um, <laughs> we're getting to movement to the natural environment. I hope you feel good in this space. I do. Um, 
Bruce Kane, a senior fellow of the Woods Institute for the Environment and political science professor, Stanford University. We were talking about the metaverse backstage. We'll have Leo Milagro Enriquez, the executive director and founder of Mycelium Youth Network. And then Jacqueline Fabius, chief operating officer, Quantitative Biosciences Institute, UCSF. Hey, let's go. Um, normally, I do not uh, speak with a script, but I'm a college professor, and I'm used to going on for an hour, and that made the producers a little nervous. So this way, we know that I'll get off the stage in about six minutes. I'm dying to see how what the rap version of my talk is. <laughs> and if it works, I may bring it to Stanford. Let's see. All right, look. Uh, just as a preface, some of you may know that I'm a political scientist that I've been on KQED and other stations in the past. In the last 10 years, I've been spending time listening to scientists make presentations at Stanford, co-teaching with them, and trying to really understand what our pathway is to decarbonization and to successful adaptation. And so this reflection is about what I fear we need to do in the next stages and what we have to do to sort of prepare for it, okay? So since 2000, California has made substantial progress in achieving cleaner electricity, an achievement that all of us should be rightly proud of. But the steps towards deeper decarbonization will challenge our personal lives much more, forcing residents and businesses to change what they own and buy, and to protect themselves better from extreme weather events such as wildfires, mudslides, droughts, sea level rise, and wild temperature swings. Many of these changes that will be asked of us and our businesses will be expensive and inconvenient. Modern life is tied to carbon emissions in inextricable ways, including how we travel, the homes we live in, the food we eat in our workplaces. Californians have committed to achieving ambitious cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. We have pledged to achieve a 40% reduction from 1990 levels by 2030, which is only seven years away, and 80% by 2050. Getting to those benchmarks will require substantial transformation in the state's transportation, commercial, residential, agricultural, and industrial sectors. Californians will have to replace their gas stoves and appliances and switch to zero emission or hydrogen fuel vehicles entirely over the next two decades. Local governments and businesses will have to substitute electric power for gas-powered buses and trucks. Residents living near areas vulnerable to sea level rise or adjacent to wild lion areas prone to wildfires will either have to move out of those areas or pay exorbitant insurance costs to cover the rising risk due to climate change. We count on technology to eventually find more cost-efficient and effective ways to make our cars, trucks, kitchen appliances, and housing materials greener and more affordable. But in the meantime, people, people, not just technology, have to change. And at this time, and it's not clear to me that Californians are prepared for or are willing to walk the decarbonization walk. When well-meaning pro-environmentalists buy an electric car but charge it at night, they are drawing power when the sun doesn't shine, which means they are using electricity generated from gas and coal plants, and our batteries are nowhere near the capacity we need right now to do storage at night. When people travel across the country to see their families, they will not be flying on an electric plane anytime soon. When people buy multiple refrigerators, they undercut the gains of more energy efficient appliances. And when they move inland in search of cheaper housing, they put more demand on the grid for heating in the winter and cooling in the summer. Many Californians obstruct climate change unintentionally even as they profess their commitment to climate change policies. They oppose wind and solar facilities in their sight lines. They resist plans to remove gas lines and they continue to buy gasoline cars and trucks. How do we turn 
social responsibility into individual accountability. Above all, I think we need to make people more aware of their personal carbon footprint. Schools and universities need to become living labs, encouraging students and their families to find innovative ways to track their admissions. We need apps to help them calculate and keep track of the life cycle uh, emissions of the products they use. Similar strategies have made people more aware of their residential energy use. But now we have to expand that awareness to all aspects of people's lifestyles if we're going to make any serious progress in coming decades in limiting greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing our carbon footprint is not just the responsibility of utility companies and governments. The inconvenient truth is that we all must cut our emissions if we're going to save the planet. Thank you. Kualitonali Nawi Noteca Lil Milagro Enriquez. Greetings, my name is Lil Milagro Enriquez, and I identify as a person of detribalized descent from the Nahuapipil's peoples of El Cuzatlan, which is now known as El Salvador. And I'm also the founder of Mycelium Youth Network, an organization that works to actively prepare young people for climate change. But before I really go into that, or as I go into that, I really want to take a moment to acknowledge right now the heaviness that we are currently living in, the state-sanctioned and continued violence that happens across black and brown communities and in gendered relationships, and as we're seeing now in the Supreme Court. I want to acknowledge the 10 black community members that were killed in Buffalo, outside of a grocery store, one of the first grocery stores in East Buffalo, that was hard fought for. I want to acknowledge my own terror right now at the potential overturning of Roe v. Wade, and that I could live in a world, that my daughter could live in a world where she has fewer reproductive freedoms than I have. And as I was processing and thinking and crying through my own pain and trauma, what felt surprising to me was how not surprising it felt. How it feels like so much of this trauma and this violence that so many black and brown communities experience, that so many women and gendered non-binary people experience, is not new. It is a continuation of white settler colonialism and capitalism and the destruction of our communities that continue to see certain people as dispensable, as disposable, and that people that look just like me, my friends, my community members, my families, are seen as less than and as seen as not worth, not worth it to a larger society. And this, for me, is a legacy that doesn't just start in this current moment that we're in. This actually goes back to, our, to my own ancestral legacies and my matrilineage. And it goes back to my own family in Cuzatlan, El Salvador. And I think about a lot as I look at our current environmental moment, which you know, we're here to talk about today. I think about how in El Salvador, there's about 15% of old growth forests that's left. And how the Salvadorian government to this day continues to proudly proclaim the destruction and the devastation and the removal of indigenous people that look just like my grandmother. People that caretake the land were currently less than half the land is actually suitable for food production. And this is a legacy that we see that doesn't just stop at the borders of the United States, that doesn't just stop at the borders of the Americas. It moves through time, and it's currently directly affecting the ways that we are in our own environmental crisis, our own environmental reckoning in this day. And this is a reality that we also see that is not just one that comes out of nowhere, that doesn't just spring out of nowhere. And so I think that it's important that even as we're acknowledging the history and the legacies of pain and trauma that are so wrapped up in white settler colonialism and capitalism, that we confront and sit with those painful truths. Because it is only when we are able to sit with those painful truths 
to reckon with that own part of our history that caused this moment, that we can even begin to start thinking about how do we move past it. Because for so many communities, frontline communities, black and brown communities, indigenous communities, this is not our first apocalypse. This is not the first devastation of our land, of our way of life, of our communities. And what we are seeing now is the fact that we haven't yet, as a country and as a world, fully reckoned with that history. And because we haven't, we are experiencing a world where our young people are terrified of what comes in the future. A world where the University of Bath, there was a University of Bath study that came out last year that was interviewing about 10,000 young people um, from across the world that said they are terrified of the future. They feel that adults, that older generations have let them down, and they're experiencing the disjointedness from going to school every day and having the adults around them tell them, this is what you need to do to lead a good life, this is what is important right now, and the reality that they then go home and experience, or in the air that they breathe, in the water that they drink, in the fact that they don't have access to healthy soil to be able to grow their own food, or even know how to be able to do that. And so, why am I talking about this? You know, it's the night of ideas. We're looking at what we can do to be able to move forward, to be able to start thinking critically and realistically about our challenges. And for me, it's important that we reckon with this history because while it is not our first apocalypse, buried in that history, the power of that history that so many in the right are trying to erase through banning of critical uh, race theory, is that we also have seeds of survival. We have ways in which countless generations have sung traditional songs, have spoken traditional languages, have passed on different ways of being in relationship to the earth, to our plant and animal relatives, and to each other. And it is these, and it is these wisdoms, these strengths, that we need to rope into, that we need to bring into our present, so that when young people aren't just seeing what's coming that's incredibly scary, they're also deeply rooted in what has worked in the past and how we can move forward together. And so part of my work and part of what I'm here to talk about today for the rest of my time is really looking at how we can do that. What does it mean to actually be an active, painful, but beautiful conversation with our young people in order to create a world that they are actually excited to live in? that one day they might be excited to give birth to children in. And so for me, like I said at the very beginning, uh, I'm the executive director and founder of Mycelium Youth Network. And our work really is about how do we prepare young people for climate change so that it is not such a shock to the system when it happens. And how do we do it in a way that loops in our ancestral traditions and practices, those places of resilience and strength and beauty that so many of our ancestors have given us that we carry with us in our DNA? And then how do we weave into that science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, the best of critical thinking right now that science has to offer? And use that as a grounding to support young people to seeing a different way to move forward in this world, a different way of being in relationship with one another. And we do that through three main programs. Our first program is just like, let's have open and honest conversations about our climate crisis. Let's, let's break it down into its smallest possible parts so that we can create realistic solutions at a home, school, and neighborhood level. Because we firmly believe that if young people are old enough to experience something, be that racism, sexism, homophobia, environmental injustice, then they deserve the words and how to think about it, how to process it, how to create a container around it so that it is not so big and scary. So we look, do that through our Climate Resilient Schools program. We break it down by environmental area, and then we say, what do we need to know to either mitigate, to this, mitigate this challenge or adapt to this challenge? And how do we again pull from those ancestral traditions and teachings and best of scientific thinking to be able to do that? Also, we have our Youth Leadership Council because we believe that young people deserve and have the right to institutional and infrastructural power to transform their schools, to take what their peers are saying, what their neighbors are saying that they're concerned about, and to build out their schools as resilient hubs. And lastly, because 
everyone deserves a space to dream and to play and to game, we created Gaming for Justice, which is my personal favorite because I'm a huge sci-fi fantasy nerd, but we play environmental justice dungeons and dragons <laughs> because climate change is already scary enough. Sometimes you just need a place to release and to process and to dream and freedom dream a different way into being. And so what we found as we've walked in these spaces and had these conversations with youth is that oftentimes we're the only people that are talking to them about that. We're the only people talking to them about climate change. And I get it, adults are scared, I'm scared, I'm terrified, and we need to talk with young people and connect with them to let them know that they're not alone. Because when we have those conversations, we actually recognize and value the power that young people have. Almost every great movement in recent history has started with young people who say, the rules of this world do not work, we are going to push back and create something better. And so we use that power, we use that wisdom, that vision of young people, and again, we combine it with the ancestral traditions and practices so that they know that they're not alone. So lastly, I just wanted to uh, end with two last slides. One is this is wisdom that one of our young people, Isha Clark, uh, who's actually with Youth Versus Apocalypse, but came and spoke to one of our events, which she said, for us, this is really about, and it sums up what we're thinking because it really is about how do we re-envision re the world that we live in. And so my ask for you today as we're thinking through the night of ideas is to join us in being able to make this possible, connect with young people in your lives, have those difficult conversations, be okay with being uncomfortable in those difficult conversations. If you're interested in joining us at any of our summer events, we have a really exciting live-action role-playing LARP D&D opportunity happening uh, in July. So if you go to our website, you can find out more. We're also just looking for financial support and being able to make sure that these conversations are happening. Amber, who's in the first row, can give you more information on any of those events if you want more, or if you just want somebody to talk to about how do you talk to young people, I would love to be able to have that conversation with you. Uh, so with that, I will end, uh, and thank you so much. Good evening. I'm Jacqueline, and I'm going to take you through a little journey, and I'll ask you to stick with me. Are you going to stick with me? Yeah? Yeah. 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 All right. So there's so many languages, and it's actually a wonder that we understand each other. But the fact is, how often do we actually understand each other? Around the World Cup, there seems to be an understanding of humanity. Music is understood by everybody around the world. However, I would argue that science is perhaps an international language that brings people together. And I'm going to tell you a short story about QBI, the Quantitative Biosciences Institute. We have 129 labs affiliated to us. We're an institute within UCSF. Our research is collaborative, it's quantitative, it's discovery science, it's disease agnostic, it's experimental and computational. We use the latest technologies such as mass spectrometry or cryo-EM. We have cell mapping initiatives focused on different disease states, uh, infectious diseases, cancer, psychiatric diseases, or neurodegenerative disorders. We invest in the young and the empowerment of women. We are however best known for a very varied symposia <clears throat> and our very robust media presence. The scientists at QBI like to make these maps. These maps are maps of the cell. And in fact, these are maps of the building blocks of the cell, which are called proteins. And what you're looking at are protein-protein interaction maps. That is to say that we look inside the cell to understand disease. So we started thinking, how do we amplify science and bring people together? We started at home with something called the QBI Happy Hour. Each month, uh, three labs nominate one scientist who's going to represent them. They have five minutes to present three slides while beer, wine, and food is being passed around. A lot of collaboration started in this environment. So back to these maps once again. We started thinking, well, what if? What if in the same way we map the cells, we started mapping the world with collaborative interactions? And what if cell mapping equaled world mapping? 
And what if protein-protein interactions, in fact, equal people-people interactions? We started looking at the world much in the same way as we look at the cells. And we started tracking our interactions, mapping our interactions, as we went around meeting people in different institutes, universities, and industry. And we found that scientists also fell into these networks of focused topics, such as cancer, technology, infectious diseases. At this time, we have a number of formal collaborations around the world, spanning from the Caribbean to Europe to Asia, to the Middle East, to Africa, to South America. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Ah. So at the same time, we started creating all kinds of event events to have people interact. We built up our media presence, and we teamed up with posthoc.com to have very unique events, such as a cooking show with scientists, or salons, where we had <coughs> curated, uh, curated events with influential people where our scientists would speak on their expertise, cancer, autism, CRISPR. We had art exhibits. We had panels. We started having this fantastic symposia series. We started having joint symposia with our collaborators around the world. We were literally on fire, and the pandemic happened. And so the pandemic, it turns out, was a great opportunity to start maximizing collaborations. Late in 20, uh, February 2020, a small group of scientists came together to start working on SARS-CoV-2. By mid-March, 22 labs had come together to be involved. And by a couple of weeks later, 42 labs at UCSF joined to form what is called the QCRG, the QBI Coronavirus Research Group. <coughs> Our group was the first to clone out DNA from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We, we tweeted that we had it available, and we sent it around the world for research to just get a speed start. At this time, we've sent these to over 400 labs in 42 countries. So back home, we wanted to start testing treatments on the virus. However, we didn't have what is called a BSL-3, Biohazard Safety Level 3 room. But our collaborators, if you remember our Infectious Disease Network, did in Paris and New York. And so we quickly teamed up with the Institut Pasteur and Mount Sinai to start sending drugs to get tested on the virus. However, it was getting really tricky at the onset of the pandemic <coughs> to send drugs to Paris. And this is where a relationship that we had developing with the French consulate of San Francisco came to the rescue. The consul called the ambassador in DC, who called the head of FedEx and the head of French customs in France, <laughs> <laughs> and assured that the drugs on a daily basis were getting to Paris very quickly to get tested in the virus. So our, our scientists, of course, made a map. Uh, we made a SARS-CoV-2 map where we were looking at how the viral proteins were interacting with the human body. This map was overlaid with yet another map made by our chemists who were looking at approved drugs, clinical trial drug, drugs and clinical trials, and preclinical compounds. All of this was happening at lightning speed. So by April 2020, there were 69 drug candidates identified and 27 drugs in clinical trial. This kind of work typically takes a decade or more. But having more than 300 scientists from academia and industry come together really made a difference, and the, <clears throat> and the research was happening at lightning speed. This, of course, got a tremendous amount of uh, press attention. At the same time, our media team at QBI pivoted quickly to start creating events online for people to interact. Among those, we created fireside chats, some of them hosted by the French consulate, to highlight this incredibly developing relationship with the Institut Pasteur. We had planned on a science fair with the French embassy in the fall of 2020. We had it anyway. We had another one in 2021, and we continued. We created content around relevant topics, such as funding black scientists <clears throat> or HIV. We were on TikTok. We were on Twitter. You name the platform, we were on it. Sorry. So our symposia were uh, momentarily halted. However, we forged on. We continued, and we had our joint symposia online all throughout 2020 and 2021. The QCRG COVID-19 Research Symposium in June of 2020, uh, with scientists presenting from all over the world, had over 800 people attending. It was incredible. So when the Biden administration recently announced a billion-dollar initiative for COVID-19 research, our group of people was very well situated. We've put together a proposal that involves 43 labs across the world. 
And when an announcement gets made, perhaps this week, perhaps next week, we're likely one of nine groups to receive funding <clears throat> for our COVID-19 research. So what did we do? We did group science, team science. We were prolific at communication and we were fearlessly inclusive. What can we do with this? Focus on different diseases. I argue politics, art, environment. The <coughs> scientific journal Cell approached us last year to ask us to write a piece to explain how we put together this massive collaboration. Nature also did a cover story on it. And so I leave you with this. Maybe this is a blueprint, a pathway for human collaboration. We use the language of science. Now, use your own. Thank you. Leo, Leo, Leo. <laughs> <sighs> I've come to you with the easiest question of the bunch, okay? Okay. Where do you look for hope? <laughs> oh my goodness. That's always a, I feel like a lot of people in environmental justice movements get asked this a lot. Um, and I think it's a, I think as a country, or I'll, I'll say for myself, I think, I really think that it's really, really easy to go to a place of hope and go to a place of needing hope. And I think sometimes we need to just sit with our grief, our grief about what we've lost, what we're currently losing in the environmental justice movement, or in, you know, in our world right now in terms of species. We're in um, like massive species extinction events. And I think that there are some days where it's incredibly difficult to get out of bed. And I sit with that grief because I think that it is that we, we have a tendency to kind of like go past it and want to get to the hopeful place or the solutions place. And when we talk to young people who are also experiencing grief, we just sit with that and with the heaviness of that. And there's, I said I wasn't going to do a Lord of the Rings quote. There's a Lord of the Rings quote that I really love. Wait, whoa, whoa. Uh, and it's, <laughs> There's like Aragorn, when people are asking Aragorn, he's the future king, whatever, uh, what he thinks. And he, like, there's moments that, you know, he has this quote where he says, like, I give hope to humanity, I keep none for myself. And I think about that a lot uh, in the environmental movement and, and, and doing work with climate justice. But I think what gives me hope, I don't know if hope is the right word for it, um, but what gives, like, what gets me up in the morning is I think about I think about my ancestors. I think about what they've gone through. I think about this is not our first apocalypse. I think about everything that they did to fight mass extermination, to fight racism, to fight violence. I think about like the songs that they sing and I let that guide me. And then I look at my children and I think, I can be exhausted, I can be tired, I could be hopeless, and I still need to get up and feed the kids. I still need to get up and prepare young people in whatever way I can for climate change. And sometimes that just needs to be enough. Thank you very much. Um, I want to plug KQED. And um, uh, right now it's scheduled for the first Friday, uh, to launch the first Friday in June. And in consecutive Fridays of the month, uh, we're doing a, a series on environmental justice. And you'll learn about neighborhoods uh, in the Bay Area that are feeling the crunch of climate change. Professor Kane, this is for you. And this is another easy one. Uh -oh. uh, do you think that personal accountability should be developed in parallel or corporate accountability should, basically should corporations and governments take responsibility first and individuals follow? Or do you think the individual should go first? Oh, you must be talking to my wife. This is the question she keeps asking. <laughs> um, look, there's no question that um, corporations, particularly ones, fossil fuel companies, that are fighting renewables um, definitely have to be defeated and have to take responsibility. But you have to distinguish between some of the fossil fuel companies that are fighting against renewables and those that are still producing fossil fuel products because we are still dependent on it, and those that are actually investing in, in renewables and solutions. 
So I think you've got to have gradations of goodness and badness and distinguish that when you build your coalition. Otherwise, it won't be big enough to win. Hmm. That is so real. That is so real. Um, Jacqueline, uh, one of the things as a reporter when, you know, outset of the pandemic, um, I was able to get a lot more people on the phone. You know, sure, people are stuck at home or, you know, epidemiologists, they're in the office, but it seemed like we had uh, more connectivity. Obviously, the vaccine was developed in um, record time, um, but people were already working on that. I guess, you know, you mentioned during your presentation about the positives of this pandemic and how um, the coordination um, was available and people were willing to. How do we keep that going um, as we as we face what we don't know, you know, the long COVID to, you know, pre-existing conditions that people have, um, the cancers that, how do we keep that connectivity going so we are sharing resources and sharing knowledge? I think we are all a different people today than we were three years ago. And I do think that everybody has a very strong desire to connect. And I think the kind of connectivity we saw happening online in a way, it was actually going back to old school connectivity where people were trying to reach out to each other because there was time. And I think that um, moving forward, I think looking at different diseases and things, um, I think we've proven that by working together in such a connected way, whether we're online or in person, is the inevitable way to work towards progress. And so I don't see us going backwards in this way. I think this is the obvious way to find solutions to diseases. Thank you for that. Um, if I could ask each of our guests in, I'll give you 20 seconds or less. And we'll start with you, Dr. Kane. Uh, what are the steps to get the rest of the US to follow California's lead? I think the most important thing is for us to be an example and to show that we can move to a greener economy and not kill the golden goose of economic productivity and, uh, and jobs for people. I think that's the most important thing we can do. Leo? Uh, I think we need to do what especially the Bay Area does really, really well, which is come up with radical, thought out, community-based solutions. I think we do that. I think there's so much innovation that comes out of the Bay Area. And I think that what people are experiencing when they don't move is a failure of imagination because they don't know what else is out there. And when we create examples that are sustainable, that are powerful, you know, to, to quote Victor Hugo, who quotes um, V for, or to quote V for Vendetta, who quotes Victor Hugo, like there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And we need to show that these ideas are present and get people excited to want to do it. And how about you, Jacqueline? I think we need incentives. I think human beings need incentives to get things going and done. And I, and I don't have the answer as to what the incentives are, but I think that if we want to move things in the environment or in communities, somehow what we do need to do is have people who represent us but who help put incentives in place for these things to happen. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Dan and Carlos, can you give me some more of those beats? I think I got some more bars to spit in a second here. Uh -oh. <laughs> he said, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> He was
struggle deep upon my chest Open up my eyes, didn't get any rest Yes, I gotta acknowledge the heaviness Look up to the sky, circles that bless Come together with the old gold crisis Yes, top troops, we got the proof Giving up the love, gotta grow the youth Yes, it's all about in this nation We gotta come together and form collaboration Uh, yes, and fight all these variants Cause variants is varying and variants together since Yeah, y'all, you know I gotta get the fire lit That's why we talking about our environment It's all around us, you know that it's hurting me That's why we going through all these climate emergencies Everybody throw your hands to the sky Cause everybody looking like... Why? Let me tell you it's dope right now I grab the microphone for sure and I throw it down It goes yes, I gotta get this off of my chest Because I do wanna replace white supremacists Yes, yes. Uh, create a world where the youth excited to Live in and give it and take it We live in, yes Off the top, the old generation's messed up Apocalypse now, we gotta tear it all up Just like these papers Disappear inside of all these papers Up into the air like yeah. the gas, the vapors Hey, you know what exactly is my worth. We have to reevaluate our relationship to the earth. That's why we gotta think about it everywhere we see. Cause we could all be flowers and trees, believe me. We just need those strands of knowledge. Critical thinking in between. So if you can't learn in college, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm walking around in the final hour. I'll see you at the QBI happy hour. And we can talk about it. Everybody knows how we about to walk around and throw it down. Yes, cause I'm a pro MC. We map in cells. We look for that pure protein yes uh, a laboratory of languages coming together you know we got these languages these angles in yes I turn in all these pages we speak truth to power so they can live the ages we need the youth in spaces we need the youth to grow we need to youth the uh, uh, like the water that hey, they flow so give me a second while I try to flip it cuz just like them I'm a scientist in the kitchen you know I'm good for the cooking it's good looking what's up everybody know hating here's a station and Max collaboration in between and hey, yo one thing I have to say I got the microphone for sure and I never play and hey, yo I'm vicious I like Lord of the Rings too that's why I treat the mic like my precious yes 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 I'm on the plane because we know that dragons aren't scarier than climate change yes we roll the dice we put together twice because we gotta grow it nice yes looking for the life and do it with the flow this isn't the first pandemic to let the world know that we're just terminate, permanent and not temporary Come together because we feel in the world is scary Break this down, yo, we got to flip in me Because we haven't recorded with this community or history Yes, we came to flip it up I said before that the old generation messed it up And then we gonna bring it down So listen to the fire This is at the night of idea and inspire Open up your eyes, kick it to the sky Yo, I'm going down and my voice is getting quiet I do not want to wake anyone up who's asleep. So put your hands to the skies if you're alive. KQED, how you doing tonight? Make some noise, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Brilliance, brilliance, brilliance. Now that was nice. That was nice. Uh, we'll be dancing um, in a second. I got a confession. I haven't seen Lord of the Rings. Um, so... I'm going to have to get the lowdown in the back. Um, let's go to movement three, or Via's Vendetta. Man, um, Debbie Lum, filmmaker and director of Try Harder, plus Rachel Schmidt, uh, documentary participant. Then we have Martha Rodriguez, the CMC Older Adult Choir Director, CMC Teaching Artist, and SFUSD Mariachi Program, plus Sylvia Sherman, Program Director at San Francisco Community Center, Talk. And then we have Coro de la Mission, um, SFC MCs. And then we have Julie Awano, the Executive Director of Content Policy and Society Lab, Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. And Jeff Chang, Author and Senior Advisor, Race Ford. Take it away. Thank 
ready? Can you tell me your name, your high school, and what is your dream college? Rachel Schmidt, Lowell High School, Stanford or Harvard? Okay, I'm going to interrupt right here. So, do you mind answering in a complete sentence, just in case I have to edit out my question? So, for example, if I say, "What's your name?" I I would answer, "My name is Debbie Lum." And hello, everyone. I am the director and producer of a film called Try Harder, which premiered at Sundance and is currently on PBS. It's a documentary that followed students from Lowell High School, like me, as we tried to get into the college of our dreams. But I actually graduated from Lowell four years ago, and. When I was 17, Debbie would ask me questions like that all the time, and hundreds of other questions. Yes, many questions. We followed five Lowell students: three AAPI Asian American Pacific Islander students, one white student, and one biracial black and white student, Rachel.、Um, and you know, we relived high school. We spent so much time at Lowell, and we got to find out what it was like to go to. This iconic high school in San Francisco. What was most interesting? Well, there's a stereotype、uh, that Lowell is a scary academic place full of ruthlessly competitive, competitive students, lots of Asians,、um, and the kids were under a lot of pressure.、Um, but they were also the most amazing, bright-eyed, funny, curious, motivated learners. Um, I'm not from San Francisco, even though I pass. I'm actually from St. Louis, Missouri, and、uh, woo, <laughs> where Asians,、um, at least when I was living there, were less than one percent of a very black and white, very segregated city. And、um, the high school I went to was so different from Lowell.、Um, when you make a documentary, you know it's really important to try very hard to be. Objective, so the story rings true, and、um, it helped that I was an outsider to Lowell. But you know, it's also impossible to tell a story、um, about a subject without having empathy for them. And I was really curious about what it was like for Rachel. Well, Lowell is an interesting place because the concept of minority is kind of flipped around, where minority groups actually make up the majority. That being said, as a black or a biracial student, I was still in the minority because when I was at Lowell, black students made up around two percent of the students' population, and mixed race students even less so, one percent. Yeah, Lowell for many decades has been this high school where being Asian American is the norm, or I would joke that it's、um, a place where being Asian American was normal because you know most. Places, it's not like that actually.、Um, there's,、um, you know, many parts of the United States where,、um, in the larger society, Asian Americans make up, you know, about six percent of of the U.S. population. Whereas at Lowell, they were it was fif- over fifty percent, nearly sixty percent of the student body, at least when we filmed, which was before the pandemic. Nowadays, when people hear Lowell High School, I think a lot of San Franciscans think about the school as it is in the headlines, namely things relating to its admission structure changing or other incidents that have happened in the past. But not many people want to talk about what that kind of environment can do for Black student achievement, student achievement for students of all kinds of groups. And how tearing that structure down can hurt students of all backgrounds. I mean, I had done well before Lowell, but I didn't give much thought into grades or what an academic career could do for my future. It's only because I went to Lowell that I was exposed to a world of possibilities, and I'm much better off for it. Rachel, could you talk about how students thought about yours and your mom's interest in academic success? Yeah, sometimes it was tough. One time, I was lamenting I had only scored a B on a recent test, and how ma- mad my mom was going to be. And a student I was sitting next to said, "Wow, I didn't know black people cared about their grades." 
And I found that disheartening because I could tell that that person was genuinely not trying to be rude, even though they were. Um, they were just genuinely surprised that a black person would care about their grades to that extent. And I had to sit there for the rest of class and honestly the rest of my time in high school and wonder, is this the consensus that my peers have about me, about black students, and how we value academic success? And that do people think my mom and I are some kind of outliers? It's a terrible stereotype and one that our society is very guilty of. Um, one of the things I really love about your story, Rachel, is that your mom, who is African-American and is a single mom, uh, she just proved that you don't have to be Asian to be a tiger mom, you know, obsessed with academic achievement. Yeah, my mom was my biggest supporter and one of the reasons that I got into and survived Lowell. And even though the film might make her seem a bit like a tiger mom, uh, it wasn't too much like that. Her philosophy wasn't really, if you get a B, you will disappoint me. It was more so, if you don't try as hard as you can and you get a B, I will be disappointed. So this trying hard concept was something your mom really believed in, um, and it's something that we associate often with the classic immigrant mentality, the Asian immigrant. Um, yeah, but your mom had that, and the environment of Lowell was definitely a lot of pressure, and your mom also pushed you. How did you feel about that? Were those expectations positive? Or were they healthy? It was a positive for me. I will qualify it in that way. It was the only high school in the city that I was able to receive an elite education for free, and I think the pressure of Lowell allowed me to flourish and challenge myself. But I do know of a few students who tried out Lowell and did not like it and transferred out and were so much happier. So every student is different and the pressure of Lowell is not for everyone. So, you know, even though the kids at Lowell were all under a lot of pressure to sort of sacrifice everything for college achievement, it is really important to remember these individual stories. Um, and you know, this is really how it should be. That should be our guiding principle when we think about the future of our students. So we just wanted to um, wrap up by making a little plug. We have a very local story with a great uh, national residence, and we were supported by three amazing local organizations, California Humanities, the Center for Asian American Media, and ITVS. And we just wanted to leave you with a little bit of a, a taste of our film. And so if you could roll the video. Good morning, Lowell High School. It's a beautiful day. Try Harder is a story about high achieving smart students at a majority Asian American public high school as they try to get into the elite college of their dreams. Harvard, Stanford, UC Berkeley, Columbia. In other words, to try to get into the hardest school that you could possibly get into. Everyone is driven. Everyone sees college is like their logical next step, and they're willing to work their tail off to get there. If I don't go to one of those big colleges, I will not be able to do what I want to do. This moment in their life is the most important moment in their life thus far. What does that pressure do to you? There's been studies that show that high achieving students have three times the amount of stress than the average teenager. From a parenting standpoint, you kind of get swept into it. I've stayed up at nights worried about, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing too much? Am I asking too much? The pressure is insurmountable at times. It makes me feel not the best. There's a stereotype that high achieving kids are academic machines, but they were also simply adolescent teenagers. Smart kids are human too. I mean, I don't know how to better put it than telling their story. Okay, 
Well, so nice to see all of you. So great to be part of this night of big ideas with so many creative thinkers. Thank you so much. I'm Sylvia Sherman, and this is Marta Rodriguez Salazar. We're from the Community Music Center here in San Francisco. And we believe that music education, arts, and culture are integral to a more, connective and more connected and inclusive future. Um, Community Music Center is celebrating its 100th year um, this year, 100 years of providing music education uh, to people of all ages, regardless of financial income. Accessibility is a very broad lens of Community Music Center. And yet as we reached our 100th uh, anniversary in the middle of the pandemic, in this period of racial reckoning, uh, we knew that it was an important time to really reimagine our work, looking at what we do in the classroom, looking at what we do uh, engaging with the community, and how we can work with others to build greater awareness of how uh, the arts, how music education, how culture can address social issues in our communities. We want to just highlight a couple of examples for you um, from our experience. One of them is working with the school district, um, where music education, they approached Community Music Center about eight years ago to form part of an initiative to teach mariachi music in the school district. And this was conceived of as a way to address educational inequities and cultural equity. Um, understanding that um, music education and the arts were not being enjoyed by the broad diversity of students in the district and really wanting to find a way to uh, encourage and welcome additional students. And happily through the, the mariachi program in partnership with artists like Marta and others uh, in the community in partnership with the district, eight years later we see, yes, there is a new generation of musicians, musicians and young people who wouldn't otherwise have been enjoying the benefits of music education and the educational outcomes that are associated with being part of an arts program. Uh, and so Marta's gonna speak a little bit more about that experience, but the other one that we wanna highlight and you're going to hear from some of our members of the Coros de la Misión in just a minute is at the other aid, uh, end of the age spectrum, which is working with older adults. Um, we've had the opportunity uh, to work with uh, the Department of Disability and Aging Services and 12 uh, senior center neighborhood centers throughout San Francisco to provide a choral program. And this is actually something that grew uh, quite a bit through being part of a research study with UCSF, which was able to determine that singing in a choir has wellness and health benefits for uh, members of our uh, older adult community. That um, singing in a choir can uh, increase interest in life and to um, decrease loneliness. And one of the things that we know is that isolation amongst older adults is a social determinant of health. So through singing, we're addressing well-being in our community. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to Marta to speak from her experience with both of these programs. Thank you, Sylvia. Good evening. Buenas noches a todos. I am fortunate to be part of the Community Music Center since 2000, so it's 22 years of believing, believing in the mission that everyone can belong through the universal language of music. I've taught hundreds, if not thousands of students from different countries, different backgrounds, different ages, as, I, as much as I go to different schools teaching mariachi to, school, to, to people who really don't know much about music or a lot of it, I then have the pleasure 10 years ago to start together with my wife, Jennifer Peringer, who's also at Community Music Center for the same amount of time, um, these older adult choirs that started to like be a pump to everyone's life. It was a, a creative process where everyone, we were asking our students, which songs do you like to sing? Tell me from your country. So we have one choir that sings in three languages, two that sing only in Spanish. And uh, we created a, a community that is a family for us. And throughout the pandemic, it was one of the hardest tests we have of resilience. We were able to testify real life how they were so strong. They went through the barrier of not even knowing how to use their phones and then to go into Zoom and try to fear, figure out how to belong how to sing through Zoom, which is the one of the hardest things ever, by the way. You need to be muted. What's mute? You know, or you need to push that button. Okay, well, it took us as many months as you could imagine. But they, I mean, the resilience, the energy, the communities there. And we are survivors. 
And I think music made us believe that we belong and that we have something to say. And it doesn't matter how old are you, you still can sing and can communicate. So here we are with several of our students from, you know, more than 300 students of the older adult choirs, uh, representing three of our choirs, Coro Solera, Coro de, de la Treinta, and Coro de Centro Latino. We will sing a song that's very representative of our times, how we've been healing through the pandemic, with a song that talks about when someone dies, girl, instead of crying for me and mourning, sing me a song. La Martiniana. task to uh, talk to you right after this amazing concert, uh, but I will try my best. Not as talented, I promise, at least singing. Um, hello everyone, my name is Julia Wano. I am uh, the executive director of the Content Policy and Society Lab at Stanford University. And um, tonight I would like to suggest to you uh, that we think about rebuilding free speech. 
mm. whatever that means. Mm. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, rebuilding free speech for what? To move towards safer and more inclusive internet. Mm. And I think this conversation comes, unfortunately, at you know, a good moment because we've just had this tragedy that's happened. But before I get into the, the, the depth of the subject, I wanted to do a quick poll, um, a communist poll. You'll just have to raise your hand, please. <laughs> um, who here thinks they, think they know about what content moderation is? If you do, please raise your hand. OK. Very interesting. They're representative of the population. But actually, it's, uh, it's a great introduction. So thank you. Great introduction to, my, to the point that I was trying to make. I actually, rebuilding free speech is making, um, well, caring about content moderation as a democratic issue and as an issue which we should care about as citizens who care about our societies, uh, the stability of our societies, and the safety of our societies. Because as you know, more than ever, especially after the pandemic, internet is our world. This is our, it's, it's not virtual versus, you know, physical, it's our world. And um, of course we have to think about what happened two days ago in Buffalo when a, a man, I don't want to call his name because I really think it's important to center on, on victims. But nevertheless, a, a person decided to uh, kill people um, in, in a supermarket, randomly killing people uh, based on hate for another community. And what we have been learning in the past two days is that that person had prepared um, his, mis his crime, really his crime, had prepared his crime through various social media channels. And the person even committed the worst, I think probably the worst crime probably in the internet age, which is broadcasting the horrible acts live on social media platforms, and particularly one that's Twitch, Twitch which is uh, used by uh, gaming communities around the world. Uh, but then the video was also transported to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and the likes, and viewed millions of times. So. This is why content moderation is important. What is content moderation? Content moderation is simply the act of deciding what we are allowed to say, to publish, uh, almost to think <laughs> online and on, especially on social media platforms. Uh, but when I say what we are allowed, who is allowing us? Who is deciding? That is a fundamental question. And I'm sure that if I follow my conversation with you with a name, Elon Musk, and a social, another big social media platform called Twitter. I'm sure here you've been reading the news the past two weeks, and you've been reading about the different reactions to the fact that, well, this billionaire decided to do billionaire and to buy <laughs> Public Square and, you know, decide that he was the one who was going to save free speech and save First Amendment for everyone. That sounds like a beautiful project, but I can assure you it's totally unrealistic. Even in the United States, and that's something that I've personally learned. Uh, I'm a lawyer myself. I, um, I, I learned law in, in, in Europe, in France specifically. And our conception of freedom of expression is, from what I thought, completely different from the conception of the First Amendment and free speech particularly. That is to say, the, Im the image that we have is you're allowed to say anything in the United States and in Europe and France you, are, you have laws that you know, prevent you from um, negating genocides or any other types of very violent uh, speech. Well, I, have to I had to come to the reality that this is not exactly the reality. There are things that are not allowed even as per First Amendment standards. Uh, for instance, what we saw happen in Buffalo, I don't think it would have been okay, even in any courts. Uh, and I've read uh, extensively academic publishing about that. And, and I found that very interesting that, yes, even in the United States where the First Amendment is so 
and limited. Nevertheless, there is a conversation, a lively one, a political one, about the limits of free speech. What are we not allowed to say online? What is endangering our democracies? What is endangering our safety? What is making our societies less inclusive? And so once you've identified this problem, uh, you have to answer the question, who decides the rules? Who, who should be deciding? Well, honestly, I think we shouldn't care whether or not Elon Musk buys Twitter. I think we shouldn't care whether or not Mark Zuckerberg is the CEO of Facebook. I think I personally don't care whatever uh, Susan Wush, I think it's Susan Wojcicki, the CEO of YouTube, whatever she thinks. I personally think we shouldn't care. In a democratic society, we shouldn't be, you know, uplifting, well, making our lives, making our discourses online depend on whether or not the CEO woke up in a good mood today. <laughs> Basically, uh, that's what used to happen. And so, what, are the, what is the solution? Who should be making the rules? And that's one, I, I, one of the ideas that I wanted to share with you and the work that I do at the Content Policy and Society Lab. I think society should be making those rules and I think there should be um, groups, individuals, experts, li jurists, judges, whatever you want to call them, uh, who could be able to tell us you know, in what direction we should go with regards to our speech online. Uh, of course, government rules are important. I know it's a very sensitive subject in the United States, but I think at some point it's important to have this hard conversation about regulation. But that doesn't mean that the governments, the states, can regulate anyhow. Uh, we have seen very bad regulation in the past, including in very democratic societies that have made it even more di difficult in countries where there is less freedom of expression. Well. Those legislation adopted in democratic societies have given a pass to dictators today to censor internet. One example is Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, rejoicing himself when a, a former um, chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, passed a law, a fake news law in 2018. Mm. So all this to say, and I'll end there, uh, there are different ways to go with regards to deciding how the rules, sh what are the rules and how they should be implemented. But I think one of the most important ideas and one that fascinates me and, and that I'm really particularly happy to be participating in is holding those technology accountable, telling them when they've done wrong, exposing them and making sure that they correct the wrong that they've done. This is the work that I'm doing in a, with another hat as a member of the Meta Oversight Board. For those of, the, who, of you who don't know, it's a new body that makes decision, content moderation, well, not content moderation decision, that makes decision on Facebook and Instagram content moderation decision. For instance, when President Trump was banned from Twitter and uh, from Facebook and, and Instagram, among with other social media platforms, but specifically those two, well, the company Meta reached out to us and asked us, did we make the right call? And we told them, you did, but... And I think that conversation is extremely necessary in a democratic, in a healthy democratic society. Uh, but unfortunately, right now, we're not having that conversation. We're focused yet again on whether or not Elon Musk is in good mood today. Hopefully, we will switch to a world where we really don't care and where we have institutions, individuals, principles, values that we will not rescind in the name of fighting fake news or fighting hate speech online. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. There's a very old story about Asians and Asians in America. It begins as a story about the Chinese who are once called the sick men of Asia. In this story, they're a contagion, impure, forever foreign, needing to be purged. In this story, a pandemic comes in the form of a people. At the beginning of the 20th century, San Francisco's top health official and physician so that the Chinese would, quote, breed and engender disease wherever they reside. When the bubonic plague spread, officials built a wall around Chinatown to seal in the Chinese. But when the plague continued to spread across the city, they seriously discussed burning Chinatown to the ground. 
This story of the diseased Oriental was key to the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first time in US history that a group had been banned, a racial group had been banned from immigrating. And this story drove the white mobs who violently purged Asians from their segregated settlements and lynched them. From then to now, this story didn't just cause violence against Chinese, but against Filipinos, Japanese, South Asians, Southeast Asians, and so many others of us. So when political leaders began using phrases like the Chinese virus or the Kung flu, they were hardly being original. They were drawing on a story that went back centuries and that it had deadly consequences. Now, in this moment, we've all had too many fresh reminders that hatred, anger, and fear are too easy to stir up but very hard to suppress. And yet, even in these times when we're all too often reminded of what the worst is that we can be, we have also seen the best of what we can be. We've seen 26 million people in the streets marching for black lives. We've seen millions standing along Asians and Pacific Islanders. We've seen acts of kindness. We've seen acts of sacrifice. We've seen acts of grace. In a word, we've seen solidarity. Solidarity is such a beautiful word because within it are so many other beautiful words. Care, fairness, generosity, justice, equity, mutuality, community. But we also recognize that the stories of solidarity are not the kinds of stories that have been told so much in these times. So last year, after the mass shootings in Atlanta, in Indianapolis. Dozens of us Asians and Pacific Islanders, filmmakers, writers, poets, performers, artists, designers, cultural strategists came together. We knew we needed to stop AAPI hate. But we asked ourselves, what do we want to start? What kind of world do we want to build? And that's how we came to launch the May 19th project. Solidarity is an act of commitment and it's a leap of faith. The notion of the Asian American itself came about because of solidarity. In the 1800s, as white leaders debated excluding Chinese, it was Frederick Douglass, a former slave, who gave the most profound defense of them. He wrote, I want a home here not only for the Negro, the mulatto, and the Latin races, but I want the Asiatic to find a home here in the United States and feel at home here both for his sake and for ours. Commitment. Douglas and others in the Black Freedom Movement had imagined citizenship for all, an ideal that was finally secured in the 14th Amendment, which made imaginable the right of all immigrants to become naturalized and birthright citizenship for all the children born on this soil. It's the reason that we're here. From that time, Asians and Pacific Islanders of very different backgrounds shared traumas of mistaken identity, enforced labor, imposed segregation, and brutal violence. So by the late 1960s, young people of Asian descent had begun to call themselves Asian American. The notion that such diverse peoples with different languages, religions, different ways of life, some of whom had even fled conflicts with each other, that they all shared something in common was in fact a leap of faith. From the start, the words Asian American and Pacific Islander were not meant to merely signify a census category. They were acts of solidarity. And over the last half century, we've built Asian Pacific, Pacific America through shared experiences of food, of music, of religion, of custom, and culture. Solidarity begins as a necessity for people to find belonging, safety, and peace. But then it powers the building of vital, healthy, generous communities. And these were the stories, these were the kinds of stories that we needed to tell. Stories of struggle and aid, stories of belonging and joy. When it came time to name the project, we quickly settled on the examples of two close friends and freedom fighters, Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X. Yuri and Malcolm shared a birthday. May 19th, 
And they also shared a commitment to solidarity, to making a world where everyone could be free. Yuri was born and raised in San Pedro, California. But when she was 19, after Pearl Harbor, her father was targeted and likely tortured by the FBI, and he died soon after. Then she was incarcerated in Jerome, Arkansas, one of 120,000 Japanese Americans who were rounded up and placed in concentration camps during World War II. After the war, she moved to Harlem and began organizing with her neighbors for integrated schools and civil rights. That's where she met Malcolm X. They became fast friends and challenged each other's perspectives. In the last year of Malcolm's life, as his thinking about racial justice was evolving, the two were in constant dialogue about how to change the world. So on May 19th, 2021, we began releasing 14 videos day by day, telling stories of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders working in solidarity across ethnicity, race, class, gender, and generation. Stories that spanned 150 years. They include the story of San Francisco's Fillmore District, where black, Filipino, Japanese, and Jewish families made the fertile ground for Sugar Pie DeSanto and Etta James to change the direction of rhythm and blues. The story of the student strike at San Francisco State University that led to the creation of ethnic studies. The story of a Hmong American woman named Yua Vang Lee, whose son was killed by Minneapolis police, who heard George Floyd call out for his mother, and who decided to urge Asians and Pacific Islanders to stand for black lives. The truth is that our lives have always been characterized more by acts of interdependence, mutuality, and joy than by acts of division, segregation, and hatred. Our circle of care always extends further than we think. Our impulse to take care of one another is deeper in us than we think. So how do we rebuild together? Solidarity is the work of seeing each other of standing together, of acting for each other. Solidarity is our shared past, and solidarity is our shared future. I want to close with a video, the last in our series here, uh, of a poet, an Oakland poet named Michelle Lee, who's the executive director of You Speaks, and who does her poem, Dreaming America. Thank you for listening. We poke a hole into the sky of stories that says we are better off divided. We disrupt the American mythical parable that promises security in our separateness. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have always dreamt radically. Perhaps that's what's most important to know about who we be, is that we have been keenly suited to this sacred task of threading justice to joy, stories to solidarity persistence to power in our pursuit of freedom. And the pursuit for freedom has never been fought ourselves or alone, but we've always done this together, like Yua Vang Lee and Al Flowers. You see, when we dream, we dream a new America. We carry the courage that once belonged to the giants whose shoulders we stand on today. You don't choose the times you live in, but you do choose who you ought to be. Wong Kim Ark and Frederick Douglass, a restaurant worker and abolitionist who helped make the path to citizenship possible for my grandparents and me. No borders, no nations, no We dream of a path to citizenship so we can actively participate in our American democracy. When we dream, we remember the deep tradition of movement workers coming together across dividing lines to create a cultural response to racism that's rooted in power, healing, and solidarity. This is where dreams come from, from radical self-love and love for community. From stirrings like Bayard and striking like Itliog and Huerta and Chavez and Veracruz, from holding the humor and heartbreaks of this life and still waking up each morning with the humility of wonder. From radical self-love and radical friendships like Yuri and Malcolm, Grace and Jimmy, Bruce and Jesse, every dreamer knows that when we add ourselves to the collective, we are forever connected.
see how they do me, y'all? I gotta bring my own chair on stage, Jeff, just to sit by you. <laughs> so, Jeff, I wanna start with you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's good. Pushed uh, me by Otis. Uh, the Japanese, they were incarcerated during World War II, and many thousands lived in the Bay Area. They lost their homes, they lost their communities. Um, Ron Dellums, uh, one of the first black congressmen in the state of California, um, told this riveting story on the House floor about his Japanese neighbor that he used to play ball with, his friend, how his friend had to pack up to go to um, to go to prison, essentially. We talked um, before you came on about how important it was for us to have solidarity, um, especially at this time. Can you say a little bit about why that is a movement between communities that needs to happen? Well, I think one of the other things that we're talking about backstage is that, um, especially in this moment, there are so many stories that are out there to divide us, right? And people are working uh, overtime to uh, create narratives that say that we can't function, that we can't be together, that we have to go back to a time that never existed um, uh, in order for us to, to be whole. But actually, the, it's like Langston Hughes said, the, the America that we can be, we've never been and yet we have to become, right? Um, I just mangled you like Langston Hughes' approach. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all should read Let America Be America Again, which is the retort to Donald Trump that he wrote like, like more than half a century before it, Donald he Trump He predicted arrived. the Make yeah. America Great Again movement, essentially. Absolutely. In this poem, he, he anticipated it and was able to talk about uh, the importance of us coming together. So, you know, in the, in the moment, um, uh, in in the the summer the late spring in the summer of last year, um, there were a lot of, of narratives that were out there uh, trying to, to divide us. Uh, Stop Asian hate. Well, Asians hate people too, and all these other kinds of things. And so, what we wanted to try to do was to to highlight the importance to, of solidarity um, for other Asian Americans to our story. The fact that we're really right here because of the Black freedom struggle. Right, and the that's facts. yeah, that's facts, and that um, in turn, right, that the that solidarity will, will get us to where it is that we want to go, not uh, fear, not anger, not hatred, but this leap uh, of faith uh, towards um, our, our shared vision of healthy communities. Thank you for that. You. Uh, tonight, Jeff and I came up with an idea. <laughs> that you'll uh, be hearing about. Um, shout out to Night of Ideas for introducing <laughs> people together. Debbie and Rachel, um, this question is, goes to y'all. Uh, with the change from merit-based election to a lottery ballot to enter Lowell High School, have high achievers been deprived of the Lowell experience? Or has the general population been deprived of being exposed to high achievers? It's a, uh, a loaded question, <laughs> one that uh, was very much in play when three people of color were recalled um, from the school board, but I'd like to get your thoughts. Maybe you can speak to that <laughs> first. <laughs> Ooh, just go right to the easy question yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, um, this is something that we've talked about a lot. And of course, when I made the film about um, Lowell High School, it was before all of this happened and everything was sort of, um, you know, but I think, you know, we we're looking at a school that had less than 2% of the population that was African American and um, a feeling that, um, you know, race at, um, Lowell High School is something that has been debated over the years with um, many, you know, 
um, lawsuits and counter lawsuits about who can be allowed to get in. And I think, um, you know, I am not an expert on Lowell High School, and I'm also not a, an education policy um, advisor, so I'm not sure that I'm equipped to answer that question um, in, a, in a useful way. Um, but what I would say is what I saw with students and how they felt about, what they told me about the changes in, in the policy. And, you know, people have felt um, a range of, of feelings about it, you know. There are people who feel like, um, you know, this is um, something they've worked their whole lives for. They have, um, you know, relied on this idea that maybe you can get an elite, quote unquote, education, one that is free at Lowell High School, um, but it is a place that is competitive with a private institution that costs an awful lot of money that people cannot afford, and that, um, you know, what, how, how do you get to that point? Um, and by, um, rem you know, changing the sort of um, academic requirements, um, that, that is taking that away from students who maybe didn't have that opportunity. I've heard that from a lot of people. I have also heard from a lot of students who are um, maybe younger than Rachel's class, and many of them were Asian American, who actually totally agreed with that policy that you should change um, into a lottery, mainly because they believe in equity and they believe in, um, you know, overwhelmingly the students that we filmed were, I mean, I can safely say this in San Francisco, Democrats, <laughs> Democratic, um, you know, they, um, you know, if you ask them about affirmative action, for example, they really supported affirmative action, even, in, even though um, in terms of college admissions, even if you're Asian American, and there's this notion that, you know, it would hurt your chances, so-called, you know, affirmative action. But they, you know, believed it, and, and maybe they wanted the, you know, like maybe there's a way in which the pressure could be reduced by this change. But, you know, at the same time, it's also, you know, it's, it's a really complicated issue, because as Rachel was saying, we, we had this conversation beforehand about what is that saying in terms of the change of admissions and how that influences equity, right? Yeah. Ultimately, my answer to that question is kind of a disappointing answer, but I don't really know because on one hand, I will say I wouldn't be here today doing the things that I'm doing if it weren't for Lowell. I didn't know so many things were possible for me without that academic environment where my peers were influencing me to try harder and challenge myself. But then on the other hand, I will admit, as a black student, as a biracial student, it is hard to look out into your student body and not see many faces that look like you and to not have that sense of community. So I understand where that change in admission, striving for equity, I see I see what it's for, but you know, it's a hard question. Is it accomplishing what it's supposed to do? Thank you for that. Debbie, you're right. It's about, you know, younger people think, oh, <laughs> Julie, before we go here, um, <laughs> Elon Musk, free speech, <laughs> Twitter, what can we do when um, it's, it's beyond obvious that hate is being incited by people who have a megaphone, who have a large following. Um, is it content moderation? Is it having people banned? Um, how can we, while acknowledging free speech, how can we um, you know, call out hate speech for what it is and, and not allow it to be magnified? Absolutely, that's a great question. Probably part of the answer is that uh, it's also a, a mistake from, from us as a society to overfocus on social media, forgetting that social media is just a reflect of how bad our societies are. 
Mm. If our societies are sexist, well, <laughs> you'll find that sexism online, and it's real. Thanks. Countless studies have said that women are, especially women who are vocal, tend to be more harassed online, insulted, and all the bad things that can happen to a person online. So I would say it's a reflect of our societies, but we shouldn't forget uh, more traditional media that normalize hate speech. Mm. That Thank simply you. talk about replacement theory, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, I'm saying thank you for oh, yeah, saying... Sorry, I, I was talking too much. I media, I think journalists, journalism hasn't been held accountable for allowing some of this hate speech to prol proliferate. I mean, replacement, I mean, we've been, you know, giving megaphones to, to men, particularly, who have wanted that. So uh, you're right, it is reflected. But um, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful because um, I, 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 I wanted to start my talk with this, but I, I forgot, I was really excited by the great music before, so thank you. Um, but we, social media is very uh, uh, paradoxical. I, I, I can talk about my story. I wouldn't be here if there weren't, you know, social media. Social media have allowed us to sit at the same table than powerful men who I would never have been able to touch before. I mean, touch in terms of vocal, being vocal. Well, no, <laughs> sorry. Because <laughs> no, I'm mixing French and English at the same time at this time of the day. It's very hard. But, um, um, but yet, those same social media are very violent for people who look like me. That is to say women, and especially black women. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, I, all this to say that I think we should trust ourselves as society. And that's why I started my talk by saying content moderation should not be just a thing for experts, should not just be a thing for mm. billionaires who want to appear good in society. It's about us. It's about what we want tomorrow for the online spaces that we're creating, but also for the offline spaces that are influenced by whatever happens online. Such a good idea. <laughs> I think we're, um, oh yeah. Oh. I wanna say thank you to the audience. I wanna say thank you to everyone who came and shared. We're gonna dance up here if y'all want to. Dance um, party. Um, please join me. <laughs> yes, clap those hands together. If you know the history of hip hop culture, before the MC came the DJ. So to round out tonight, we're gonna let this virtuosic beatboxer DJ with his mouth cut up some ideas. People, people, people as pandemic, pand. Hold technology accountable. Hold technology accountable. Smart, smart kids are human too. Smart kids are human too. Arts, education is intricate. In, in, intricate. Rebuilding free, 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 free space. Space, space. Solidarity, solid solidarity, justice, ain't no justice, it's just us. Justice, try harder, try, does she don't succeed? Try harder, community, community, music, 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 makes us believe we belong, long, long. When someone dies, sing me a song. When someone dies, sing me a song. Singing, singing on Zoom is impossible. Hey, hey, yo, minor, minority is the majority. Majority, minority is the majority. I feel right at home. Feel at home right here. Black academic success. Black academic success is fresh, 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 fresh. How do we rebuild together? To say it. How do we rebuild together? Everybody, come on. How do we rebuild together? Come on. I said, how do we rebuild together? Fresh, y'all. We out, y'all. Thank y'all for coming out tonight.
You can find MC Infinite on Instagram. You can find the Bay Area Theater Cypher on Instagram. Thank you all for coming. Make sure you give love to all these brilliant minds. Go out with the ideas that you got tonight and make some real change in the world. Yes, yes, y'all. If you want to hit me up, hit up MC Infinite. That's E M C W E Infinite. Okay, on all social media. I also have a spoken word album I just released called Return to What. So please pick that up. Hit my social media. Bless. Peace, y'all. Bayer Theater Cipher in the building. Much love.